The countdown to kickoff continues. SEC football getting underway in just over three weeks. We're joined by a good friend of the show, Chris Gordy of Locked On SEC. Also does a bunch of other stuff in Houston, Texas. Different radio stuff covering the Astros, LSU, etc. But talking SEC football, one of the best in the business. Chris, what's going on, man? Appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, man. Appreciate you having me. It's uh, good to be on. Saw you just a couple weeks ago at SEC Media Days. And, man, it's uh, here we are less than a month away. Yeah, great to meet a link up in Dallas there, Chris. And for the OGs that have heard you on our airwaves before, because I think this is the the first time we've had you on as SEC Unfiltered, it's great to hear you and not hear you sound like a robot of sorts. I don't know right. what was happening before. Yeah, I know you and I had a fun fun, uh, fun time with that in Dallas. But you sound great, my man. You sound great. You look great. We're happy to have you here. Um, let's start with this, Chris. Is there, you know, again, like you mentioned, we were in Dallas a couple weeks ago. We're a couple weeks away from kickoff. This is, I feel like this is kind of the point, maybe within the next week or so, we start to get really, really antsy, right? Like we've kind of, we've done the whole list season thing. We've done the Mount Rushmores. We've done the, you know, all kinds of power rankings, like everything. Is there a preseason narrative storyline, anything that you're already, that you're tired of hearing about and you just can't wait for kickoff to get here so we can either get questions answered or we can just talk about something else yeah i'm i'm surprised like to me we're not we're not talking enough about the loss of nick saban like i understand it's a big topic and all this but i'm shocked by how many people just assume alabama is just going to pick right up where they left off there's not going to be any issues not be any transitions just caleb board's going to come in he's just going to keep this train on the tracks they're just going to keep rolling and you know it's like the preseason coaches poll just came out and they're top five. Like, I don't know if this Alabama team is a top five team. I know what the team was under Nick Saban. I don't know what Kalen DeBoer's Alabama is if they're top five preseason. Um, I mean, look, we we can use some to you know to do some things like okay, Jalen Milrow looked like he came on towards the back half of last season, looked pretty good. We assume Kalen DeBoer and you know have an offensive mind is going to put him in the best situations and all this. But, I mean, I'm reading a, a takeaway this week of fall camp that, like, Alabama's starting to work in a lot of those true freshman DBs, and they want to get them some good playing experience against Western Kentucky and kind of ease them in because, you know, it becomes like, okay, well, we know we have it in, in Malachi Moore, but, you know, what, are, what do we have in some of these other guys? And I'm like, this, this is like, this is Nick Saban gone. Like, we're so used to, they just, we, we set it and forget it. Like, we know what we have back there. And so I, I say that to circle back to, I still think this thing is is it's not wide open, but like we know George is going to be good, but they got a brutal schedule. You know, schedule's pretty tough, and I think we most assume that Texas should be good and they have a forgiving schedule. But everybody and their brother at SEC Media Days was just like, "Yep, it's Texas and Georgia, and then who else after that?" And I'm like, "Wait, like who who says it's just going to be Georgia and Texas? Like it, there there are other teams here, and obviously Ole Miss is up there." And uh, and Missouri, and we know their schedules set up very well for them. You know, I think LSU and Tennessee are in that mix. What's Oklahoma? But it, it just, to me, like the bigger picture is with Saban gone, it feels like anybody can can step up to the plate and you know maybe contend for one of the better teams in the SEC. Now I do feel like Kirby, these last couple of years, has established himself as the next guy. And if they win a championship this year, that's three out of four. We start throwing the word dynasty around, and now. Suddenly, the narrative for the last 15 years of Saban just flips over to Kirby. And we go, well, he's the king of college football, and he just runs it all. And, you know, that very well could happen. But to me, for the last 15 years, Chris, we've been counting down the days till – and I say this for the rest of the fan base, not just Alabama, <laughs> but every other fan base, we were counting down the days until Nick Saban retired. And now he's gone. Ding dong, the witch is dead. And people don't have that monkey in their back anymore. And, and I think of past coaches. Like, Les Miles would have killed for this day. Um, you know, you think Gene Chizik, like past, uh, like if Nick Saban had never come back to the SEC, Les Miles has at least one, if not two more championships at LSU. I think Auburn has at least one more, if not two, you know, who knows what Florida would have been like in all, in all those years. Um, Kirby and Georgia probably have at least another one. So it's just, it's interesting just kind of looking back on it in hindsight on, on how much Saban had just hampered everyone else in this league. And held them captive while he was having these this dominant run at, at Alabama. But um, yeah, I just think we're I, like I said. I think we've talked too much about Georgia, Texas, Georgia, Texas, Georgia, Texas. And it's like, guys, we don't we don't know. Like this thing might be wide open when we get to uh, 
to the end of the year. And by the way, Georgia preseason number one in the coaches poll, what they say? It hasn't been since Bama in, I think, what, 17 or 18 when they were preseason one and then actually went on to win it all. So the odds are right now are not in Georgia's favor. Especially, Chris, with a 12-team playoff and it being as wide open as it's ever been, more teams getting a crack at it. I'll ask you this, Chris, because I think you make a great point. Now, I've said this a lot this preseason that, you know, what's what's so fun about college football, one of the things that makes it so fun for us is like right now, everybody's got their their predictions and everything fits in this neat little box. And we'll get like four or five weeks in, as you know, and that'll that'll all have gone to hell, right? I mean, it'll be, you know, th things we once thought, the madness will ensue, like who knows what may happen. If it's not Georgia, Texas, I'll ask you this, this Chris, how many teams do you think can win realistically win the SEC championship, are capable of winning it? Because Georgia and Texas are obviously capable. Ole Miss capable? Bama? I mean, is it four? Is it five? Is is the list longer than people realize of teams that can win the SEC championship? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we have to go with history a little bit. You know, Ole Miss has never been to Atlanta. They've never played for an SEC title. You know, Missouri did, but that was under... Gary Pinkle, and that's, you know, a decade ago. So, you know, Eli Drinkwitz has never been there before. So it's it's a little bit hard to envision a world where Ole Miss and Missouri gets there. Um, but, you know, it's, look at how these teams are built, what they just did last year, what they bring back, and what the schedules are. And it's like I was trying to do it a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, somebody asked me for a bold take, and I said, well, you know what? Missouri takes a step back this year because – you know, they, they, Eli just exceeded everybody's expectations. Reality says they're going to take a step backward. And then I look, keep looking at their schedule. I'm like, well, like, even if they lose their two toughest games, they're still 10 and two. And I'm like, I'm trying to talk myself into like, how do they go eight and four? I mean, it would take, it would take them losing a game they're not supposed to. Like, you know, their toughest game at Alabama, right? They lose that one. But it would then mean like they have to lose at AM, home against Oklahoma. And then I have to talk myself into, Missouri loses at home to Auburn like it's I'm not saying it's crazy but I'm saying it's like I have to talk myself into that because Missouri's got Brady Cook back they got Luther Burton back they got you know tons of wide receivers three Theo Weiss all these guys they've improved their offensive line at least on paper so like you know maybe the defense takes a huge step backward with Blake Baker gone you lose Darius Robinson all these pieces to the draft maybe that's the case Mizzou loses games 42 to 39. I don't know, but like it, that's, that's where it gets tough. And so, you know, to, to answer your question, like who else can, could contend, you know, I, I look at track record a little bit. LSU has shown at least once every three to four years, they jump up in there and, and make some noise. I, you know, at least Brian Kelly schedule this, you know, it says this is supposed to be the year they take that big leap forward, but I still look at that defense and I'm like, ugh. like I was watching some, some film of their practice today and Kyron Lacey and Chris Hilton look awesome as wide receivers like they're gonna fill in just fine for Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas but the DBs are getting beat mm -hmm. and I was looking at it today a number one of them was number 14 the safety uh, from A&M that transferred over at Jordan Gilbert and he's getting beat I'm like well he's supposed to be an upgrade he's supposed to help them and so anyway like I, I, I I'd still have huge question marks about LSU's defense but at least they're a program that's been to Atlanta they're a program that's been to the playoff before um, Oklahoma is an intriguing one. Like what is Jackson Arnold? If, if Arnold is what everything he's supposed to be, by the way, I've seen the highlights of him connecting with Dion Burks and, uh, you know, obviously Nick Anderson, we had on our show a couple weeks ago. He's, you know, stud was a stud as a freshman. I think he's going to take a big leap. Um, that's a team that like Oklahoma, if they beat Texas, which by the way, they did it last year. Uh, they've done it a lot in the last decade. If Oklahoma does that, I know their schedule's tough. But who knows? Maybe they win some shootouts this year and, and and you know, maybe could get to Atlanta. Uh, Tennessee is the big one, too. I mean, they they lose Jordan Thomas this week, and that's a big loss as their, you know, star nickel nickel guy. But if the defense can be slightly improved, and Nico Iamaliava is everything we, we expect him to be, great receiving core, good running backs, um, you know, I think Tennessee could certainly be that team as well. It's just so hard, Chris, to put yourself in that mindset of there's no East or West anymore, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, when Tennessee played Kentucky, you're like, all right, here's a big one. You got to beat, you got to beat your East team. When Tennessee played Georgia, oh man, this is for East supremacy here. And now it's like, you know, every game's important. Like you can't slip up anywhere because the two best teams are, are going to go to Atlanta. So, you know, th th that's kind of the collection of teams. Maybe A&M is, is the dark horse. Um, 
You know, I, I just don't think it's going to happen for Kentucky or Florida or Auburn or Arkansas or some of these other teams in, in the SEC this year. Not to say they can't have nice seasons, but, you know, I think that's more of a level of an eight and three, nine and four as a nice season, but you're not getting to Atlanta with that record. Yeah, you mentioned it, Chris. It's interesting being at Dallas, making the predicted order to finish. The East and West definitely gave us some organization, um, whereas one through 16 is just a lot of chaos, a lot of moving pieces, much less of that organization you mentioned. And, and you mentioned some of the, I'll call it, I feel like there's tiers, obviously, in the SEC this year. You mentioned some of those mid to maybe I should say lower tier teams like the the Floridas, the Arkansas, I, I throw the South Carolinas in there, Mississippi State's. Vandy's, if you will. Uh, anybody at the bottom of the pack, do you think, is there a team that you look at and feel, maybe you feel strongly one of them's going to take a jump or, or you see the potential there for them to get to a maybe surprise seven or eight win season? Which of those would you buy the most stock in at the bottom to elevate their standing by the season's end? Yeah, I've been telling everybody, be careful with Arkansas, just because, you know, Bobby Petrino is a pretty damn good offensive mind, and I like the pieces that they brought in. Taylor Green, I don't know if he, I, like, put it this way, I don't know if he's an SEC quarterback. Could be. And if he is, watch out, because Arkansas is going to win some games they're not supposed to this year. He's a dual threat guy. They've talked about, you know, um, you know, he watched a lot of film on Lamar Jackson when Bobby Petrino was at Louisville, coaching him up, and who knows? I mean, we see every year teams in this league have trouble with those dual threats. When they get out in space and take off and run it or throw it, it's hard for defenses to to game plan and slow down the, you know, those guys who have that elite speed when they get out in space. So, you know, if Taylor Green lives up to that hype, that billing, you know, and I think what he won the Mountain West uh, championship game player of the game or whatever for for Boise State, like with better talent around him, I think I think Arkansas has got a chance. I love Jaquindon Jackson, the running back they brought in from Utah, who was formerly at Texas. You know, I, I think there's a chance that Arkansas could play spoiler and, and beat some people. But again, like, what's the ceiling? Seven wins? Like, so if Arkansas goes seven and five, they're keeping Sam Pittman. Um, he's got to get back on the recruiting trail and start to load up on that on that side of things. But I think it sets up well, and, and we look at Arkansas and go, nice job, Sam Pittman. But the other team I, I keep telling everybody to be careful with, and it's because – they're the ultimate wild card. I don't know what the hell Mississippi State's going to look like. Like, <laughs> I know Jeff Levy's a great offensive mind. Every player I talked to at Oklahoma loved Jeff Levy. They were like, oh, that's the that's the dude. That guy knows offensive mind. Obviously, you know, he's been in the SEC before. Um, he knows what it takes to, to, to win in this league. But, my God, I mean, it is a full hodgepodge of just guys from the transfer portal. You know, I keep joking, like, Mississippi State fans – that first home game, you're going to have to buy a program and figure out who the hell all these guys are on your team. You know, Blake Shapin played a lot of games at Baylor and, you know, I think is is a seasoned vet that he said the the one thing that sold him on coming to play, he wasn't coming to play for Mississippi State or playing Starkville. It was Jeff Levy. He said he loved Jeff Levy in that offense and he wanted to play in it. And so you come over and, you know, running backs where I don't know really what you have in Jeffrey Pittman and, and, and Kevon Lee and some of these other guys. But the receivers, they look pretty damn strong in the spring game. I mean, there was some chemistry there with uh, is it Akarai. I don't know how you pronounce his name, but the kid mm -hmm. coming over transfer, uh, he looks pretty damn strong. And then, um, you know, Jordan Mosley and some other guys who've been around there. And then that offensive line, Albert Reese kind of anchors it, but they brought in some dudes through the portal, like Marlon Martinez from, from LSU. And, you know, if, if things start to click there, I look at Mississippi State as like, that's one of those games where you don't take them seriously. And you look up at, at halftime and it's, you know, Mississippi State 14, Texas 10. You're going, wait a minute. Like, the hell, how is that happening? And it's just because they're the wild card. Like, I have no idea what to expect. We all expect them to stink. Like, everybody's picking them to win whatever, three or four games and be bottom dwellers and be terrible. But I just don't know. Like, I know Vandy didn't upgrade their roster tremendously. I know it's going to be incredibly hard for Clark Lee to win, a, win several games this year. But Mississippi State and Arkansas, I just look at it as like, what are, can they both go, you know, can Mississippi State go six and six and win one or two SEC games? They have no business winning. I, I think that's one you want to be careful with. And, it, and it's the it's the cliche in this conference. You're always like, oh, take everybody seriously. But you don't. I mean, players don't. There's always a, you know, when Bama plays LSU that next week, it's always a letdown for both teams. Like you're always, because you put so much emotion and everything into that, into that game. And that's what I think Texas and Oklahoma are going to learn very quickly in this league is there is no let up. You cannot let up. If you, the minute you take your foot off the gas pedal, that's when you get beat. And so, 
we'll see. But um, yeah, I just, again, my, my big message, and I talked with a couple of assistant coaches at Mississippi State staff, and they're all excited, man. I mean, they're, they're coming into this league, not going out. Oh, it's going to be a tough transition year. They're, they're expecting to win games immediately. Chris, you mentioned Clark Lee. I want to transition the conversation to hot seats specifically. And there's a few in the SEC, certainly. It's always a talking point this time of year. Billy Napier at Florida, Sam Pittman at Arkansas. You talked a little bit about Arkansas, and I actually agree with you. I think they could be an overachiever this year. But still, the, the seat is hot there in Fayetteville. Clark Lee, some have talked about, needs to show something, whatever that means at Vanderbilt. Shane Beamer seat warming a little bit. Um what do you make of the status of the SEC when it comes to hot seats? Who do you think is on the hottest seat? Are there any names that maybe I didn't mention that you think, or maybe if they don't have a great season in 2024, the seats could maybe start to warm? Like, for example, I mean, a Hugh Freeze at Auburn. People have chirped about that. If they didn't have a good year, right, all of a sudden, it's like there's going to be pressure going into year three. Brian Kelly at LSU. Like, it's interesting, Chris. The 12 team college football playoff, it's given more opportunity to more teams. I think it's also increased pressure at some places, too, though, where all of a sudden it's an even worse look if you don't make the playoff, right? Because now even more teams are getting in it. And that means more teams from the SEC are getting in it. And there's more than a couple programs in this conference that expect to be there more often than not. Well, and that's why I said be careful what you wish for. When everybody wanted conference expansion, it's like, oh, yeah, Texas and Oklahoma, bring them in. Yeah. Well, uh, my motto is always like someone has to suck. Someone's got to be bad. <laughs> you can't all go 10 and 2, 12 and 0. Like someone has to lose games. Mathematically, you're playing everybody. So, you know, and then on the on the flip side, Mark Stoops at Kentucky's going, we ain't going 4 and 8. You know, Shane Beamer in South Carolina, they're like, no, nope, we're not going to just lay down and go 3 and 9 for you. So, like, it, it's it's tough, man. It makes I, – I wonder if if some coaches – like, will we celebrate even more going six and six? You know, like when we look back at his schedule, put it this way, you look at Billy Napier's Florida schedule Florida this year. If he goes six and six, I think there's a realistic possibility the Gators like go pat him on the back, go, Billy, you're our guy. How'd you weather that storm? How'd you win six games with that schedule? Like, you know, there's that's a realistic world. And I always say, what does it look like? Right. I mean, like you win six games, you get the bowl eligibility. Did you lose a couple by a hair? You lost one by a field goal. You lost another one in overtime. Like, you know, if you, if that happens, that's a lot better than, well, our six losses were all blowouts and we lost by 30 on the road to Bama. And, you know, I mean, so it's always what does it look like? But it's funny you bring up Florida. Phil Steele, we, we had him a locked on SEC a few weeks ago, and he said uh, he's got Florida winning like eight or nine games. He thinks – he thinks their talent is actually really good. Like when you look around and Graham Mertz is a seasoned vet quarterback and now you bring in Derek Lagway, um, you know, we'll see what Montreal Johnson sounds like. He's going to be ready to go for the start of the season after that, that knee surgery. But, you know, I, I think we, we made too much of the schedule for Florida and forgot to ask the all important question. What if Florida is actually pretty good? Like, you know, what if they're halfway decent? Uh, what if they can actually figure out the special team snafus and get guys lined up right and on the field in time? If they do that, you know, I, I think this talk of Billy Napier on the hot seat kind of goes out the window. Now, again, I think he's got to get to six six wins. I think five and seven still leaves a bad taste in everybody everybody's mouth of what they're spending in NIL money and all the resources that Florida has. You know, this is a champion. This is a program that you can win championships at. If we look at back at the last twenty five years, you know, Urban Meyer proved it. Obviously, Steve Spurrier before him. Like, this is a program that should play for championships. You know, once at least once a decade. So. Um, you know, I think expectations are fine there, but yeah, I mean, in terms of hot, hot seat. Yeah. I think it's Sam Pittman and Billy Napier. You both got to get the six wins. I think anything less than six wins, you're, you're gone. And then, you know, Clark Lee, I think you got to win at least one, if not two conference games I again, maybe he doesn't get the six and six, but maybe he goes five and seven and they upset two sec teams like they did two years ago when they beat Florida and they beat Kentucky. I think that could save him. But, man, you're, you're longing for the days of Derek Mason now. You're looking back going, man, Derek Mason actually at least had his relevant winning a, you know, pulling off an occasional upset as opposed to whatever the hell that was last year at Vanderbilt was, was god awful. So, and then you mentioned, you know, the, the next set is, you know, Shane Beamer, man, can't have another season of missing a bowl game. And I, I know the schedule's tough, but if he does that, it's going to lose a lot of goodwill from that crew. And they, they really are starting to turn up the heat on him. Hugh Freeze as well. You put all your chips in on Peyton Thorne, he better damn well be the guy. Because if he ain't, 
you, you're really putting yourself in a tub of hot water. Because all I heard when they hired him was, oh, this guy wins. This guy wins everywhere he's been. Look at what he did at Liberty. Look at what he did at Ole Miss. Look at, and now, like, you have two subpar seasons at Auburn. We're starting to go, dude, I don't think you're cut out for this job. So, you know, I, I think that's certainly the one. But I think everybody else is kind of safe. If Brian Kelly, it would take a catastrophe for Brian Kelly. Like, they'd have to go 6-6 six and six at LSU and everybody going, what the hell? But even still, that contract they gave him is – I mean, it's loaded. Like you're basically all in. You married yourself to Brian Kelly. There's no divorce here. You you you're married to him at least for a couple more years. So I would just say get used to it and say, Coach, what do we need to do to, to, to fix this thing? <laughs> but that's what they did this offseason. I mean, they gutted the entire defensive staff. So you know, there's that. I, but like all the other ones, Elko's going to have a honeymoon period where he gets he gets some time. You know, Venables just got a contract extension at Oklahoma. You know, the only one that could really leave for maybe a better opportunity is Lane Kiffin at, at Ole Miss. And we know I've just become conditioned, Chris, that Kiffin's name is just going to be thrown out for every job, every offseason. And I think even Ole Miss fans have come to accept it. He's he's signed every extension in the books, yet every time a job opens. And let's see, maybe Penn State moves on from James Franklin after this year. The number one name is going to pop up, Lane Kiffin. I mean, it's just it's going to happen. So. Um, but that's kind of it. I think Stoops is pretty locked in at Kentucky. I think, um, you know, Heupel's doing fine at Tennessee. They love Sark at Texas. So I think everybody else is kind of in this thing for the long haul. Chris, you mentioned Texas and Oklahoma. I'm curious to get your thoughts on this. So obviously coming into the year 2024, Texas is in a much different position than Oklahoma is. I think we all understand that. One is, you know, fighting for the college ball playoff and the national title. I don't know that Oklahoma's quite in that same boat, the over under seven and a half, whatever that may mean to you. Uh, I think if they could go eight and four or nine and three, it would be a really good year. But, you know, and you mentioned that to Oklahoma fans, and it's it's like blasphemy, right? And the fact that they're being picked to win six or seven games is blasphemous. And, and they'll tell you about the history of the programs. I mean, you look at the rivalry since 2000. I think Oklahoma's got an 18 to seven advantage in that rivalry. You know, when Nick Saban made the comments at Media Days that, you know, Texas isn't going to run the SEC like they ran the Big 12, Oklahoma fans were shouting from the mountaintops. They didn't run the Big 12. Oklahoma did. So I ask you this question. We know what the short term holds. Over the long term, let's say over the next decade, when we're talking in 10 years, God forbid what platform it's on or what system or service or whatever, who do you think is set up for more success in the long haul? Would you buy more in Texas or would you buy more in Oklahoma? Because again, Oklahoma's been the better program. But right. I think Texas fans believe that Texas should be that superior program. So, I mean, I know it's a difficult question. It's hard to speculate. But who, who would you buy for the long term? Well, this is a, this is a telling year for Texas because, you know, I, I, same song and dance. I've, I've been there before. I, I saw Tom Herman and, uh, you know, that Texas team hold up the trophy and go, we're back, <laughs> as Sam Ellinger said politely. But, you know, what happened? Texas wasn't back. <laughs> they they pr quickly proved they weren't back. You know, I, I've brought this up about Sark before, and I like Sark. Sark's a nice guy. We've interviewed him before, and, you know, he's actually a, a big um, – if you ever get to talk Sark, ask him ask him about the old Lakers team. He's a huge old-school NBA fan, loves the Lakers and all that. But um, he is – look at his track record as a head coach. Prior to this, you know, his best season at, at – Washington, he won eight games. His best season at USC was nine and four. And his best season at, at Texas prior to this past year was eight and five. Um, that that double-digit win season last year is almost an outlier. And yet we're supposed to believe, ah, oh, they're just going to do this every year. This is what Texas is. They're just going to win double-digit. And you're coming to the SEC? Like, I know the schedule is, is it looks easy on paper, but, you know, this is a big year for Texas. If they do not get the double digit wins, double digit wins this year in the regular season, not counting a bowl win or whatever, but like if they miss the playoff this year, I think we look and go, Texas, what what, what happened? What what'd you do? What you, what went wrong? And maybe it's the defense. I mean, it, we, I think we discount the losses of Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat and guys who were high draft picks and losing Bo Davis on the as the D line coach. You know, it's I think, you know, that they had one of their starting DBs left after the spring game. Like there's uh, there's some question marks on that defense. But Oklahoma, it, look, I get it was Lincoln Riley, but man, they were making the playoff just about every year. Oklahoma was punching their ticket every year. Now, every year they go and get their butts spanked by an SEC team. It felt like every year in the playoff. But they um, Oklahoma has been the better program, to your point. Now, Texas has got the resources. 
but I've been here in Texas, got the resources for years. <laughs> I know some of their donors who write the checks. They, they don't have a problem writing the checks, but they still haven't proven it on the field in back-to-back seasons. So that they're going to have to prove it this year. Now, look, the, the roster looks, the future looks bright. If we all believe in Arch Manning, which I'm a believer in Arch. I think he's the real deal. I think, you know, when he gets on the field after Quinn Ewers, Texas is going to be set up pretty well. They've been recruiting pretty damn well at that wide receiver spot. They bring in Ryan Wingo, big five-star wide receiver. So I think, um, you know, I, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see. But, like, if I had to bet my money on it, I don't know, man. I, I think Venable, Venables waited his time at Clemson for the right job to come along. Like, he turned down a million jobs throughout the years. He looked at Oklahoma and said, this is the right job for me. And the big thing he has done is he's gotten that defense a little bit better than they used to be. That was a big reason they were ready to move on from Lincoln Riley because they were like, dude, it's great. The offense scores 60 points and, you know, we make the playoff every year, but then we, you know, we we give up a billion. So, you know, at least they've addressed that. That D-line getting Dominic Williams was huge through the transfer portal. You know, I like some of the pieces in the secondary. Obviously, Billy Bowman grabs all the headlines. Danny Stutz meant linebacker. They're they're both going to be studs for them this year, but, you know, if I had to put my money on a program that like will win more, just more games period over the next four to five years, I put my money on Oklahoma because the track record has shown they can do it. Texas. I want to believe in them. I just, I got to see them do it this year and prove, Oh, Sark has set up. Uh, I wouldn't say dynasty, but he set up a, this program that is an elite program and is ready to compete year in and year out for the next four or five years. Chris, like I mentioned, top of show, we're just over three weeks away from kickoff at the time of recording this. I want to get your take briefly on week one, just what you're most looking forward to. You know, some of the top games, we've got Georgia Clemson, we've got Florida Miami, Notre Dame, Texas A&M there in College Station. We've got LSU, Southern Cal and Vegas. A lot of other smaller, dare I call them snoozers, not conference games otherwise. You know, some notable debuts, if you will, but nothing too, too crazy. Of course, the action gets going on Thursday with Missouri and Arkansas. But just, Chris, what you're most looking forward to from week one of the SEC football season? Well, I mean, we, we get some great, you know, non-conference matchups in, in week one. I love that we get Clemson, Georgia. I think that's a great test for Georgia right out of the gates. I know they're still sending about a two-touchdown favorite, but, you know, Dabo's still recruited well. I know he, he refuses to get into the NIL world, but recruiting-wise, Clemson's done a really good job, and they still have – a lot of elite four- and five-star talent on that roster. You know, Miami and Florida is the monster one. I think that's almost a must-win for Napier. You know, on the flip side, too, like for Miami, people are looking at that one going, hey, are they the real deal? You know, you go get your quarterback through the transfer portal, and, you know, they spent a, they have spent a ton of money in NIL. So that's a monster game on both sides. If Florida wins, huge feather in the cap for Napier. If Miami loses, man, they're really starting to question, do we have the right guy in place? Um you know, the rest of them, obviously, Kalen DeBoer, they open with Western Kentucky, but you want to see a big dominant win. Like, can you imagine a world where Alabama's up 10 nothing at halftime at Western Kentucky? I mean, <laughs> the Bama fans will be screaming. They'll already be calling Paul Feinbaum to get on hold for Monday morning. So, you know, there, there's that one. And then, of course, Notre Dame A&M. A&M's kind of been picked as, as that dark horse that everybody's going, you know, oh, this is a team that can win eight games and nine games. And, and it, it was funny, the week of SEC media days, after about six or seven people said, told me that AM was a dark horse, I said, at what point are you no longer a dark horse? At what point are you just, hey, Mike Elko's a damn good coach and AM can hit the ground running? By the way, they have the second most transfer, you know, like second ranked highest transfer portal of anybody behind Ole Miss. Ole Miss was number one. AM was number two. They brought in a ton of big pieces through the portal, including uh, Nick Scorton, the big defensive end from Purdue, who I think is going to be top five in the SEC in sacks this year. So a big one there for a and I know the reports are out this week that Notre Dame's already been having injuries. One of their mm-hmm. starting offensive linemen's already out for the year. And so they're getting banged up, and it's in College Station. I've been in that place for some of those A&M Alabama games. That place is loud as hell. Now, maybe not the loudest, like, you know, the folks at College <laughs> Football, uh, it's the, the EA Sports game want, to, want us to believe, but – I think uh, I think that play is going to be rocking. It's a Saturday night on ABC. I think that's a big one for AM. They're still sitting at, like around a one point favorite. So big one for them. And then of course LSU. I was at the Florida State game last year at Orlando. It was ugly. LSU wasted opportunities early in that game. Jaden Daniels had a fourth and short. They didn't convert. They left points on the field. I think if LSU can go back in time, they convert those those easy short downs. I think they're up by double digits on Florida State at halftime. And I think they don't look back. I think LSU 
wins that game. Instead, they kept the door open, missed you know, leaving points on the field, and then Florida State kind of they put imposed their will on them down the stretch and that uh, third quarter into the start of the fourth. So it, this for Brian Kelly, that's two straight season openers you've lost. You cannot lose to USC to open the season. You just can't. By the way, you're the one who scheduled this. Like in my mind, I was like, if I'm Brian Kelly and LSU, there's no reason to play these anymore. Like scrap this from your schedule. Go schedule Southern Miss or Alabama A&M and call it a day because we saw last year with the schedule Michigan played, no one criticized them for playing Bowling Green and Eastern Kentucky and, I don't know, St. Mary's High School. Like no one gave a damn because at the end of the year, they went, well, they just beat Ohio State. And it was like we just didn't care about anything else on Michigan's schedule. Just went, well, they're number one. So I think the committee has shown they don't care about, like, the non-conference games – you beat USC in your LSU, great. But you're not going to get extra brownie points because you beat USC in week one. You're just going to go, ah, it was just a win. So, uh, But an important game for Brian Kelly. LSU cannot afford to win. You lose that one, man, you're already behind the eight ball and saying we can, you know, we have to go nine and two the rest of the way to, to make a playoff. To your point, Chris, been a while since LSU has won a season opener. That's got to change, no doubt. Chris Gordy locked on SEC, like I mentioned, one of the best in the business. Chris, I appreciate you taking the time. Let folks know where they can check out all of your work. Yeah, we're doing uh, Locked on SEC five days a week, just uh, talking all things uh, SEC, kind of catching up, catch up on the news and stuff. A little bit different from what you guys do, but uh, a lot of the same great topics. And uh, I've talked to multiple people. It's, it's funny, you know, People tell me, uh, I listen to your show. I listen to Chris's show. I listen to this other show. I said, look, we're, we're here for everybody. There's enough. we got enough damn teams in the SEC now. There's enough SEC love to go around, and, and we could spread the SEC love. So, yeah, check out Locked on SEC, of course, wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, Chris, keep, keep it the great work, man. I appreciate you taking the time, and we'll definitely do this again soon, no doubt. Sounds good. 